Welcome on inside yet another edition of the Business of Social Podcast panel edition powered by STN Digital. I'm your host, David Brickley. Uh, I bring in my producer, Will, as I always do. I am so excited for this, Will. And thanks again for you for all the work and booking some really amazing guests, some top leaders across major brands. Um, we're going to start, of course, in the product and apparel um, section of the universe when it comes to our guest. And really the the whole goal behind this panel series that we decided to create is to find the silver lining. There's so much, listen, there's a lot of you know heartache and there's a lot of troubling news out there when it comes to the pandemic. But what are the silver linings? What are the things we learned as business owners, as leaders? How are we going to become better as a people that we learn from this time period that we can now take throughout our careers three months four years, a decade down the road. Um, and Will, you and I kind of sat down and said, who would we want to talk to? What are the brands that we think would be awesome for our listeners to gain a lot of knowledge from? And we did just that. Yeah, and I think it's nice to have the, the goal and the theme of the panel be, what is working for you guys? What is right. successful? What has been helpful? What can you share with people listening and the people on the panel to just improve their meetings, their lives, their calls, whatever it is. So just a nice overall positive um goal and I'm looking forward to hearing from them. Yeah, and it was obviously the brands that succeeded or survived or even thrived during this was the ones that pivoted quickly. And what's really interesting for me to talk about is at the large corporation level, when you talk about, you know, the the, the folks we're going to talk about, Swiss Army Knife and uh, Saucony, you know, these are large corporations that usually there's 17 layers of approval just to add an additional color to one of their products and they didn't, you know, that wasn't what they can do. They had to pivot extremely quickly, quickly, be nimble. Um, and I think they found a lot about, about themselves because every brand became a startup company essentially during this because literally every 24 hours you had to, you know, aim, ready, fire uh, when it came to your brand and your messaging and, and everything about your business. Yeah, I think the names in the panel will, will speak for themselves and the knowledge that they can share and how they pivoted. Um, more so than I could ever do, but I, I just think it's something we've never done before, and I'm really excited for the turnout. I couldn't say it better myself. Producer Will leads me right into my next topic, which is the guest. Uh, we are going to be joined by Don Lane. He is the CMO of Saucony, which is a high-performance running shoe and clothing for men and women, as a lot of you are very familiar with that brand. He also was a former SVP brand and creative of DraftKings, which if you've noticed, they're stocked recently. They are doing just fine. Um, we're also going to be joined by Nate Checkets. He's the CEO and co-founder of Roan. A lot of you know of it. Um, they, they provide a great product, a premium men's performance lifestyle company. Founded, Will, just six years ago. It's amazing how young they are as a brand and how well-known they are uh, throughout the industry. We're also joined by Hillary Hartley. He's the president at Victor and Knox, uh, Swiss Army. Pocket knives, of course, and we've all owned them. I think every human on earth has a Swiss Army knife at their disposal somewhere, some way. Uh, but they also do cutlery. They also do travel gear, luggage, and much, much more. Um, and then Steve Lennard, he's the global VP of marketing and product creation at the North Face. So talk about an amazing lineup. The North Face, we have Swiss Army, we have Roan, we have Saucony. I mean, when it comes to product and apparel, uh, if you can't get any knowledge or any uh, little tidbits you can learn from this panel, I don't know which one we'll do. So again, we wanted to separate these out. Well, we have like a food and beverage panel coming up. This is kind of our retail product, um, you know, uh, apparel, you know, panel. But I'm really looking forward to it. You guys are going to love this. Once again, Don Lane, Nate Checkett, Hillary Hartley, Steve Leonard. You guys are going to love it. All right. Um, cool. Well, I'm very excited for this panel. Thank you, gentlemen, for joining me uh, really into the, in the product and apparel space that we wanted to dig into and roll our sleeves up. So uh, I'm really excited to have a host of gentlemen that have been uh, giving me the pleasure to join us on the panel today. We have uh, Don Lane, who's the chief marketing officer of Saucony. Uh, we have Nate Checkets, uh, CEO and co-founder of Roan. Hillary Hartley is the president at Victoria Knox Swiss Army. And Steve Lesnard is the Global VP of Marketing and Product Creation at North Face. Gentlemen, thank you so much for joining us. I'll start with you, Don, if you could just give us a quick background of uh, your role and what you oversee day to day. Sure. Yes. Thanks. Nice to see everyone. So I'm the Global CMO for Saucony, and that's primarily known as running shoe uh, brand um, that's sold through run specialty channels. It's a premium, premium brand in running. 
but also we've been around for over 120 years. And a, another big part of our business is the Saucony Originals Lifestyle line, which are which were our silhouettes of running shoes from the 70s, 80s, 90s, and into the 2000s, just heritage shoes that um, people wear in, in lifestyle. Awesome. Steve? Hi, well, thank you for having me. So my name is Steve Lenar, and I'm the Global Head of Marketing and Product Creation for the North Space. So I'm in charge of all marketing communication uh, and product creation across footwear, apparel, and equipment for the North Face. Um, we've been around since the 60s as, uh, you know, the, one of the leader in the uh, outdoor industry and a little bit like Don, you know, like one of the, part, you know, like the unique elements of the North Face is obviously a massive uh, credential in the outdoor world, uh, in the, you know, from alpinism to, in, you know, snow and trail. Uh, but we also have had, you know, a really strong lifestyle business that came out of you know, uh, that, you know, authentic heritage in, in outerwear uh, that allows us to, uh, you know, be a global company uh, uh, that has, you know, two sides of our business as well. Awesome. Hillary, take it away. So, hi, everybody. Well, thanks for having me. Of course. Um, I manage uh, Victoria Knox Swiss Army for North America. You know, we're maybe a little unusual that we sell in many different product categories. So we go anywhere from commercial cutlery to uh, travel gear, Swiss Army knives, sell a little bit of fragrance on the side and watch. Uh, I oversee all channels of trade, so we have a little bit of uh, D2C retail, we have our own e-com, and obviously uh, you know, some strong relationships on the marketplace. Awesome. All right, Nate, take us home. Well, I'm not only the uh, newest to arrive on the phone call, but also <laughs> the, the newest brand in this group, and it's a privilege to um, to be here with uh, with all of these well-respected brands and, uh, and leaders. Um, Roan is uh, almost a six-year-old um, high-performance lifestyle brand that is focused on the men's market uh, predominantly. Um, we have five of our own retail stores, uh, but we are, you know, we also have great wholesale partners and sell, you know, we're the number one men's brand for Equinox and, um, and Peloton and, and brands like that. Um, but our biggest channel is, uh, is directly to our customer through our website. Um, and, uh, and yeah, that's, that's a bit about us. Awesome. Appreciate it. So as I told you guys, when we all met um, over the phone uh, and over zoom chat and all that last, uh, last couple of weeks, you know, the, the ideal, the idea of this panel was really to, uh, talk about, you know, pivoting marketing strategies, leadership, just so many things that I think we've all, learned and uh, really applied as leaders of different companies during this uh, COVID-19 time. So I want to just add some context at the top for the listeners of the different challenges we all faced, right, as leaders when this pandemic hit kind of early March, maybe for some of you even earlier when it came to supply chains and things like that. <laughs> but Steve, I'll start with you. Can you just talk about the immediate challenges you guys faced once a lockdown happened, once you knew this was going to be a serious pandemic that you're going to have to deal with? Yes, I think I think for us the the very first uh, challenge was to align with our values. Uh, you know, uh, as the North Face, we uh, we're really community based, and so the first thing that we uh, we actually took action before the lockdown was to actually have a, a pre lockdown with our teams, particularly on the on the marketing and the product creation side, because you know safety of our teammates was the number one priority. There was a lot of uncertainties. We didn't want to put anybody in the, any uh, you know, uncomfortable position. So the first thing that we did was focus on our own teammates. You know, we stopped travel. We actually asked also our partners, you know, our brand partners were doing, you know, we had lunch, a, a bunch of shoot that we're, uh, we were uh, uh, undergoing at that time. We were planning for that little event called the Summer Olympics was the coming out of climbing for the first time of the Olympics. So well, small we had event. to stop and yeah. pivot from all of that. Uh, way uh, early in the process and also take care of our retail employees. We run a lot, you know, we have a lot of stores around the world. Mm -hmm. And so we did like the first week was, you know, the first few weeks were really about taking care of our own people uh, and then assess how we could help the broader community, which is where we pivoted very quickly into like, uh, what could we do for first responders and the outdoor community as well? So this is really where we focused, you know, uh, the immediate, you know, actions that we had and frankly, the, the work that we continue to be uh, focusing on right now as, uh, as we start, you know, thinking about the post COVID and the slow, uh, the, the, the slow aftermath. 
And Hillary, I know for you, you guys are obviously really big about supporting your retailers because all of your product, a lot of your product is in the uh, kind of traditional brick and mortar and you guys have part of your sales or revenue as well, obviously uh, on the website and, and direct to consumer. Um, again, when this kind of news comes out for you guys in, in, in those leadership meetings, what's the first thing that comes to mind and how did you guys kind of look at the challenges ahead? Yeah, look for us, as you mentioned, I mean, we, we're pretty heavy into you know, brick and mortar traditional uh, today, and it, crucial for us was, you know, to get through, as everybody I'm sure is going to mention, is our employees making sure uh, that we got them off the road, everybody was safe uh, inside and out. But we did then quickly try to focus on our retailers and what we could do for them. I mean, we immediately uh, extended terms, for example. I mean, we had people that financially, you know, quickly got into a pinch with um, and pop shops. So uh, really what we mandated to our sales teams uh, was what can we do to support our retailers? Uh, for us, you know, we've been around 130, 40 years. Uh, the relationships that we have with some of these dealers has been longstanding. They've helped us through tough times. And uh, so we feel strongly that it's, it still is a two-way street. Um, and that, that was really, you know, the focus in terms of not trying to push more product, not what can we do right now to save, you know, business in our end, but what can we do to come out of this stronger? I mean, we're, the challenge for us is that we have some categories that are very soft. I mean, selling luggage right now is not that easy. Right. On the other hand, uh, you know, we're, we, we sell the slaughterhouses, butchers, the grocery stores, the whole commercial cutlery, cutlery business, cooking at home has been a big thing. So, you know, on one hand, we had to, you know, really look after some of the retailers that were really hurt at the travel gear. At the same time, uh, you know, we had a nice peak in terms of commercial cutlery and cutlery. So, uh, you know, we, we went on both sides in terms of supporting ones that were struggling and then trying to scramble also to make sure we had enough product for those people that actually saw a really nice uptick in their business. And then Don, similar with you, I know you guys, um, you know, have so many partners in the running space specifically, your major running stores, a lot of people like to obviously go in and try and test out their different shoes. And that's kind of the that culture as well. But again, when this all goes down, uh, where, where did your guys focus go immediately to try to, I guess my, my question for all of you is to, to limit the bleeding that every company was ultimately going to go through. Where would your guys' focus immediately? Well, similar to the other guys, I won't belabor the point, but taking care of our teammates yep. and being there for our retail partners the best way we could, that was first and foremost. And I think all good brands, it's, it's uh, wonderful to see that's how many brands have been treating their employees and, their, and also their retail channel. For us, the majority of our sales do come through the run specialty channel. And with that shuttered, uh, we, from a business standpoint, followed the customer as other all good brands do. And we went hard after D2C. We've had a good Saucony.com business and a growing business over the last few years double down on it. It's been incredible. The, the growth has been even beyond some pretty gigantic expectations, which is great to see. It hasn't made up for all of what we've lost on the retail side, of course, but we've learned a lot along the way. And as an example of how we've tried to partner with the retail channel, our newest product is called the Endorphin. It doesn't officially launch until July 1st, but we pulled forward there's been a lot of buzz about it. We pulled it forward for Saucony.com and also key run specialty third-party um, .com platforms. And as of today, you can get it, you know, a limited supply there. So, you know, really being there for the customer, running hasn't stopped. In fact, it's picked up a little bit in some markets. Yeah. And just making sure that we're where the customer wants to be. And right now it happens to be online. You mentioned too, Don, that your, your ROA is on certs. Uh, which is kind of historic uh, during this time as well. Is, did I use that word? I think so. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> I, everything's been super efficient online, but as it relates to just search, I mean, people just didn't know where to get running shoes. And yeah. so investing there early really paid off. It continues to do that two months into this experience. And so it's there, but we've also done all the other important stuff from our own organic social channels to really good performance marketing, as well as some brand building things we're doing too. So um, it's been accelerated learning curve for all of us. Yeah. And then Nate, I know you and I spoke, obviously being a, a younger brand, 
Um, you guys have just really doubled down on e-com and online and digital marketing uh, from the get-go. So you guys had those processes in place. But again, um, when, once all this goes down, uh, where did your focus immediately go to? You know, I think one of the great things for us was that our team was made in many ways to to work from home. We use, you know, so many digital tools already. Um, and while I think we all wanted and missed the camaraderie that happens in the office, um, it was not a difficult transition for our kind of HQ teams to transition to, to working from home. And, um, you know, to, to Don's point, I won't belabor kind of what we've done with our retail employees or, you know, kind of how we spent that time. But really, my first thought went to our customers and not, not our customers in relation to Roan, but our customers in relation to themselves. What were they feeling? What were they thinking? What were they going through? How could we think about them and assist them and contribute to this uncertain time? Um, and, uh, and that really guided a lot of the decisions that we made in terms of investing and doubling down on content strategy um, in those early days and trying to make sure that we were adding value to their lives above and beyond just great product. Because, you know, let's face it, in the first few weeks of the pandemic, nobody really felt like shopping. That was not what people were mm -hmm. focused on. They wanted to make sure that their families were safe. They wanted to know how they were going to handle, um, you know, e-learning at home with kids, uh, how they would balance work in a, in a new digital environment, how they would, you know, manage a form of exercise or how they would fill their time or what their mental health would be like. And so a lot of what we spent our time on was going to mm -hmm. the people that we, you know, kind of think night and day about, which is, you know, our customers and, and trying to make sure that we could we could give them, uh, you know, what they needed during this time. And then how did you balance that from like a voice stamp? I know you mentioned that, you know, a lot of brands were a little too brand heavy early on. You focus on the customer and what they were going through, which is awesome. But you also have this, this huge, um, you know, situation where you have to try to protect employees and protect revenue and again, <laughs> stop the bleeding in a sense. So how, how do you, uh, how do you balance that line? And do you think ultimately you guys did it the, the perfect way? I don't think, I don't know that anybody did it the perfect way. Yeah. Um, there's probably some things that I would go back and change, but I do feel really, really good about how we handled it. You know, the early on, I remember seeing just this influx of emails and I remember you and I spoke about this, so yeah. it's worth, worth sharing. You know, I, I feel like if I ever shopped at any company, I received the same boilerplate email, which was like, Hey, you know, we're safe. We're working from home. We're taking care of our teams. Um, and, and this is, you know, this is what we've done. And to me, it felt very, uh, you know, and so our, our team was like, we need to send one of these emails. And it just felt very self-important to me. Mm -hmm. You know, if I'm a customer and I've shopped at a brand three years ago, why do I want to hear about that? I mean, I do want to know that people are being, you know, brands are being respectful, but truthfully, I tried to put myself in the place of the customer and what, you know, what it came down to for me is like, let's send the email that you w would want to get if you were at home. You know, if we have like to that. send one, <laughs> if you have to send one, yeah, um, it better be a good one. And like a, a great email um, has to be better than no email. It's kind of what we say about meetings. It better be a pretty good meeting to be better <laughs> than no meeting. Amen. And um and so we sent this email and the subject line was not another COVID-19 email. And it started with, if you want to know what we've done with our teams and our retail employees, here's a link and you can go and you can check it out on the site. But this is about you and what you're facing. So here's something to make you think, you know, it was an, an article by C.S. Lewis. Here's um, some 30 workouts that you can do from your home. Here's some nutrition uh, and recipes that you can cook while you're at home. And here's some music to listen to, a playlist that we had put together, and some uh, some streaming suggestions. And I think we I we never received inbound emails, you know, to this kind of extent. But I I think it was like 100 to 200 inbound emails from customers just saying this was my favorite email uh, that I've ever received. And um, you know, and, and that to me told us that we had done the right thing, that we had focused on putting the customer uh, and getting in the minds of the customer. So, 
It's so funny how quickly this thing has moved because obviously the first week or so you saw a lot of brands saying during these unprecedented times and you saw the commercials and, you know, in that time, it probably was the right for a lot of brands uh, to kind of, if that was their voice or that was kind of how they spoke to their customer. But now if we all heard that, we're just so over that, <laughs> that yeah, line. So it's amazing the, what, the roll, mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, a few weeks uh, can change. Like you have to kind of, and what's interesting in marketing and brands overall is that, you know, usually you set your marketing calendar out and your annual planning a year out. And in this situation, you've really had to tear it up and, and move every couple of weeks based on, you know, um, what the news is saying and based on how people are feeling. So it's very interesting. I want to get into leadership. Um, I know for me, I'll speak to a quick example. Um, I just kind of did it organically, but I started sending e uh, about t two or three times a week, you know, kind of state of the business emails to my staff. And Nate, to your point, I was blown away, away by the employees coming to me and saying, thank you so much. Thank you for the transparency. I just think a lot of employees were scared, fearful for their jobs, scared for the future. And it seemed like that transparency, all of you guys have brought that up kind of in our one-on-one -on -one calls. But but Steve, I know you guys at the North Face really, really focus on that right away. And would love for you to share with the listeners what you learned during this time in terms of teamwork and leadership and maybe how you'll apply that going forward. Yeah, thank you. And, and uh, like Nate, you know, like uh, our big focus was, you know, our community and our community are our consumers, the one we live and breathe for, you know, like the outdoors and, you know, getting outside. And, and obviously it's reflected by our employees who live, you know, and have the same passion. And, uh, and uh, what was really uh, uh, exciting and interesting is that uh, very quickly as we connected, we, we put our athletes, we always put our athletes at the center of the conversation. So, you know, because our athletes are master of, of, uh, of adaptation. Because if you're an alpinist and you go on a big expedition, you're used to dealing with things like plants that change all the time based on yeah. whether, whether it throws at you, but also how you deal with confinement. Because these guys and girls are, you know, you know, are going on top of mountains, spend weeks, you know, within really small spaces mm -hmm. with, with teams. And it was really interesting you know, to, uh, to get, you know, to get their inspiration, uh, you know, uh, for how they deal with, you know, changes and how they deal with confinement. That's why so more from like a mindset we, or mentality standpoint, more than anything. Absolutely. Yeah. And so that's why we, you know, we, we pivoted all our strategy around what we call the United to move forward, you know, like initiative. And we use a quote from Jimmy Chin, one of our alpinists who says, it's not, you know, like, uh, you know, you know, uh, you know, like how the storm, you know, how you, you know, like uh, um, how you like, experience the storm is how you, you deal with it and move forward, you know, after the storm. So one of the things that we did right away is um, after a couple of weeks, and I'm sure some of you have, have experienced the same thing, our teammate first rallied to the cause to support our community, to think about the best way to support, you know, our you know, our, you know, our teammates and frankly, our communities through things that we did, like, uh, you know, we had mindful sessions. We had, you know, we, right after the first week, we created a, an archive of all the best content and films that our athletes and we had created and offer them, you know, to, uh, to our community saying, hey, listen, you're cooked up inside. Now's a good time to actually like uh, get inspired by some amazing things that the team has done. But very quickly, what we realized is you know, there was an extra stress that was put in people's life because they needed a way, you know, a way forward. They needed a way also to deal with the Zoom, you know, like uh, the Zoom, I would say, uh, a, a mentality everyone had. You know, like uh, people you know, got stressed by staying on Zoom. Your kids, mm -hmm. you know, were supposed to coordinate Zoom. So we also uh, had some, uh, some fun initiatives that we tested first on our employees and very quickly, we, we scaled to everyone, whether it, were, it was uh, with uh, our partners at District Vision, we organized meditation, uh, you know, sessions. We also had, you know, like a Zoom bomb meetings where we would have our athletes, you know, jump in and take over our meetings and, you know, and, and tell stories about what they were doing, which worked really well. And I would say also we created space for people. So we, you know, we, we created these and enforced this uh, personal time you know, during the week, three times a week, two hours chunk where people could just disconnect from Zoom and, uh, and, uh, and find the right balance. Uh, and uh, along, along with what we call that workout or explore time, where we leverage all our athletes to uh, give us tips on how you stay fit, you know, uh, while, you know, uh, while you're, you, you stay inside. And it proved out to be 
actually super energizing because we were really inspired by how our resilient and creative our teams and our consumers have been in seeding the, you know, that, that conversation. It's been like extremely inspiring uh, uh, to, to be part of, a, of a, you know, of that experience. Awesome. And then Don, I think you mentioned, you guys may have done this before, but you increased your guys' daily huddles anywhere from 18 to 30 people, I believe. Um, yeah. And it seems like that transparency, that just like openness from the leadership on down, like really helped your staff kind of stay the course during, during the craziness of it all. We have an extroverted group and people were missing each other. We started it for the purpose of being transparent and sharing information and cascading it down, doing it stand up to the beginning and the end of every day. And then when we started to taper back, people, believe it or not, were craving and saying, hey, let's keep doing it. Since then, I think there's Zoom fatigue and we're doing other things to keep the team spirit together. Our I apologize brain- to all you, by the way, for the 14,000th uh, Zoom. But- <laughs> Yeah. What's another one? <laughs> so um, we do think team building things. But we're a running brand. So we're, we, the marketing team will face off against the product team. And on Strava, we'll, 10 of us will face off against 10 of them. And during a day, we'll each run 2.62 miles. Adds up to 26.2. Awesome. Marketing team is undefeated. I will let you know. <laughs> but um, things like that to kind of um, be more human and live the brand and stick together. It's ironic how much camaraderie has been built, even though many of us haven't seen one another in person for a couple of months. Yeah, this is a kind of off tangent, but you and I were talking a little bit about this. Like I see so many more people running outside now, and I don't know if it's because they can't go to their gym and run on the treadmill, so I, you just see more of them on the street, or has there been a major influx in humans overall uh, working out, which would be good news for a lot of us on this panel, I think. I don't know if that's really true. I, someone was saying, I see so many more runners. And I said, that's because you're home all day looking out your window and those runners <laughs> exactly. have been there every day. <laughs> yeah. But uh, no, I, I think... Um, and San think Diego, that anyway. that's my uh, case study. It's something that can be done, done uh, alone at social distance. And so we've been promoting this idea of run solo for good. Our, idea, our brand idea is run for good. So now we're emphasizing the benefits of running solo and giving people tips and tricks, whether you're an existing runner or a new person getting up and running, just being there for them and showing how our brand promise is more than trying to sell you shoes. It's trying to help you live your life. And Hillary, I know for you, um, you guys are a little bit different where you had to have a lot of your employees you know, in the factories and in the warehouses and continuing to make the product more so than like, all right, we're all remote. Let's kind of figure this part out. So for you, I'm sure it's more about the safety initiatives that you had to put in place immediately to make sure your whole team felt safe as they were kind of the essential workers early on. Yeah, exactly. Look at Switzerland. We have a factory with 2,000 people. Um, quickly, you know, they, they built that down to what we would consider part-time. So really operating either two days or three days, alternating each week. So, you know, reducing capacity, uh, spreading people out. Um, but all the safety features that we're all aware of right now, with, I think we were very supportive in terms of all the equipment and the gear. Uh, we were adamant that, you know, people that were not comfortable coming in, obviously did not need to come in. People would, were taking care of elderly, um, you know, family folks, uh, taking care of kids. I mean, that was all done in a, to some extent, you volunteer. I mean, you're coming to work, but if you had a good reason why you couldn't be there, we, you know, we're able to adapt that. Um, in terms of office staff, pretty much everybody's remote. Mm-hmm. Uh, we're slowly going to come back this week, but same. I mean, I think we've learned a lot of what you can do from home. Uh, it's the team spirit. I think you know we've learned how to how to cope with that. Some of you guys have mentioned that already. You know, how can we stay interactive? How can we make sure we're communicating with each other? Um, Keeping it loose, I, I think all of us are having our earbuds growing out of our ears by now. <laughs> so, um, you know, how do you do this in a way that it's it's not just looking at your screen all day long? Uh, but for sure, when you're a manufacturer, you have a warehouse, um, you know, those people have been here all day, um, every day for the last eight weeks. We've all been mostly home in the safety of our four walls. So um, it, it's, you know, we've, we've done a lot of things for them just to make sure that they understand the appreciation without them our business would have come to a halt and again as as i mentioned earlier we were lucky we had you know some product categories that actually exceeded our in, initial expectations so 
you know, we're scrambling trying to get product and ship more product. Uh, so that was a little bit of a balancing act. Um, you know, in general, fortunate, most employees have been here a long, long time. Um, it's a family business. It's always been about the employees. Uh, even during 9-11, you know, we didn't lay anybody off. So um, that's, that's mm. just a culture that exists here. So uh, we, we kept going with that. And then Nate, on this topic, I'll end with you. Um, you mentioned that you guys already work remotely and you guys were able to kind of, you know, not have too many hiccups in that regard. But anything you look back on, again, it feels like it's been years, but it's only been a couple months here. But anything you look back on uh, that you guys pivoted quickly from a culture standpoint or teamwork standpoint that you're proud that you acted that quickly on? Yeah, I mean, it's consistent with what everyone said. We tried to get creative about how to find ways to interact in the, this new medium. And, you know, I think we've taken cues from our customers and from other companies. Every single week we do a team workout together um, that, you know, is totally optional. People can join. Um, and traditionally we've, you know, we've ha we have two offices. So those offices haven't had as much of a chance to interact. Um, we do we do weekly activities when we're in the office, but now these activities have been everybody in the company. We did a Cinco de Mayo party where everybody made um, made something for Cinco de Mayo, shared what they made, why they made it, you know, kind of digitally offered it up to the camera. <laughs> you know, it's been it's been goofy, fun stuff, but I think yeah. part of it has just been having fun, seeing each other, and then understanding. I think this is the most important part probably for me as a leader has been to understand that people are going to experience different emotions on different days. And, you know, I think for, I don't know if any of the other leaders felt this, but going in, there's a natural tendency to have a concern, all right, how, how are we going to stay productive? How are we going to, you know, make sure that everybody's going to be able to work and, and um, stay effective. And so much of that is dissipated in my mind. You know, not only am I impressed with the level of, production from our team but also um, there's you know there's there's some level of efficiency gains uh, but it's just really been more about understanding that people are gonna <clears throat> have various emotions as they go through this some days people are gonna be really effective and some days yeah. people might have zoom fatigue and that's all okay and learning how to process that <laughs> and just keep us moving forward over time I've been talking a lot about this I don't think it's been talked about enough is really how we've really educated a population at scale from a tech standpoint. You look at the 38 year old that's on TikTok doing dance challenges now. You look at the 59 year old mother of four that may be on Instagram. You look at the 79 year old grandmother that is Zooming her grandkids and happy hours and things like that. And without this pandemic, I don't think you can ever properly, you know, really uh, educate an entire population in terms of tech, right? I think there's a lot of meetings that all of us, I'm sure, just didn't even consider doing digitally because what if the partner, what if the um, the retail store doesn't know how to hook up Zoom or what have you? Now, I mean, we can probably make a good argument that any anybody in our in our network knows how to fire up a, a video conference call for a future meeting. And I'd love to hear from you guys how that affects um, our businesses as we move forward. Because although it's extremely sad and the pandemic is a terrible thing, it really has forced I think everybody at least in the US, um, to kind of figure this tech side of thing out that maybe would have took, it's accelerated, I think, what would have been, uh, maybe took a long time. So Don, I'll start with you if you think that's really gonna be a, a change that um, is gonna affect all businesses in the future. Well, it's a good timely question for us. Twice a year, we have our, our big selling season where we have global sales conferences and we fly people from around the world to a destination, our right. distributors, our sales forces. And it's a big dog and pony show on a stage. It'll be me, the head of product and our, our president. And it's got a lot of sizzle. And You got your Steve Jobs just, turtleneck on and the whole deal? Or? Yeah, one more thing, <laughs> all of it. And, although I'm wearing stock and he's not new balance. Yeah, of course. But um, uh, anyway, we taking place next week, but it's going to be online. And what we're doing ahead of time is we've created all these video modules, which are bite-sized five or eight minute modules about the key stories of the season, forced us to get way out in front, forced us to figure out our talk track in a more pithy way. It's more Spartan, but still fun and human. And people will consume those for a few days and then we'll do a live Zoom or virtual meeting where we do merchandising and all the stuff you would do if you were in person. So 
you know, getting people to go around the world, the, the, the human um, savings of people not having to travel, right. of um, just finding ways to be more efficient and delivering information in new ways, in a creative way has caused us all to rethink how we go to market and we're better off for it. We've already decided the next one is either October or November. We're doing it the same way. I think it's going to change how we do these moving forward. So I, I think you're right. I think it's a change for the better in some cases. Um, Steve, what about for you guys? How do you think really people being educated at scale from a, from a tech standpoint changes how you guys operate as well? Cause I think every company, right. Is going to try to um, cut costs mm -hmm. wherever they can as well. And if you can do something just as well, virtually, that you used to do in person, it's definitely going to be a consideration. Yeah, I think, you know, to, to Don's point, we like at the North Face, we create footwear, apparel, equipment, very technical equipment. So we're in very different, you know, from backpacks to, you mm -hmm. know, climbing gears to, uh, you know, very technical tents that right now are, you know, on base camp in Everest. And what one, one of the things we did, we just had a, a big, you know, our big, you know, go to market sales meeting, you know, you know, last week, and it, it was all done virtually. I think also, and so the idea for us of uh, being a lot, and we've been used, you know, used to, uh, to technology because we deal with four different, you know, like uh, continents, you know, on an ongoing basis. I think the biggest shift for me has been uh, two things. Number one is the ability to uh, uh, focus and help the team, you know, really sharpen what it is that they want to be known for and what is really important for the team, you know, to, uh, to spend their, their energy against, um, uh, has been one, one element. I think the other one is the implication for us of being more virtual as a deeper roots, even on the product creation cycle. So no one could fly to factories, no one could touch, touch fabrics. So it's been really fun to see how creative the team have been working with our partners in Asia through, you know, photography, through, uh, you know, digital product creation rendering, which we believe are going to make us more nimble and a lot more efficient as well, because uh, moving forward, I think we'll uh, we'll definitely uh, take all the learnings that we had to uh, to create over the last two and a half months to implement <laughs> a, a much simpler, uh, faster, you know, product creation and engagement process with our teams. Frankly, that will get us closer to consumers as well, and the ability to be more agile and react more. So these are definitely big learnings that we're going to take forward. Yeah, and Hillary too. You mentioned, uh, or well, I should say, when it comes to your retailers, there's so many that are spread all over the place. Obviously, do you think the same thing when it, digital trade shows or, or different product launches that you guys can now potentially be able to leverage the fact that more people are tech savvy and can actually uh, inherit that information? Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, so we've obviously many trade shows. Uh, have been digital show the trade shows we had started with that already last year as a test and and uh, i'm glad we did um on top of that catalogs has been a big argumentation back and forth you know some people still want printed catalogs we're all done with that so it's going to be digital show roaming digital mm -hmm. trade shows um i i think you know the relationships again where we come from where we still work a fair amount with brick and mortar the trade shows have value but uh the emphasis in where we're currently investing and you know as was brought up earlier being nimble being more agile being able to adjust things on the fly uh, making changes to assortments all that you know the things that we as leaders try to do day to day it probably doesn't trickle all the way down to some of the, the salespeople. um you know it's forcing your hand and it's forcing your team's hand to to use these tools so all around i think uh it's kind of this digital re revolution that's just been accelerated um, Know, maybe we would have we would have been there probably in two three years anyway but right. this overnight within eight weeks probably pushed us ahead two or three years um so yes i mean we're refocusing i mean for sure we're, we're trying to save costs but at the same time i think you know as, as we're all leading brands in our category we can come out of this strong i think we can gain market share there's obviously going to be smaller brands that are really going to struggle so uh, yes, we're not doing things traditionally, but we, we are overspending right now and, and making sure that, you know, some of these tools are, are not just for now in the short term, but this is where we're going to be long term. Yeah, I know for a lot of brands, really, again, overnight, traditional marketing was pretty much turned off when you look at at a home, when you look at an arena, potentially, you know, different conferences, trade shows that were kind of those traditional marketing levers. 
um, you pretty much had to say, okay, scrap all that. Let's focus all in on digital. And Nate, would love to hear from you. Obviously, every brand tried to pivot almost immediately to what you know people were going to be in need for. And for Roan, I know you guys sell some amazing like you know dress shirts like this potentially um, that you know most people didn't need anymore because they weren't going to the office. But you guys have loungewear that is a perfect fit, I think, for a lot of people that were spending more time at home. So, did you guys almost look at that? immediately and start to pivot dollars and PPC and things like that to kind of be able to uh, leverage that? Yeah, you know, um, it's been great from categorically for us that way. Uh, it feels like every single day I hear from somebody in my network who says my entire quarantine uniform has been <laughs> drone based. Um, <laughs> and, uh, and I, I, you know, I'm obviously biased, but I like to think that our dress shirt is so comfortable. That it's what you want to wear when you're even at home. We have had customers say that they'll put the dress shirt on and wear, you know, shorts. And um, we had there was actually a reporter who was I saw that where yeah he was wearing our oh our really that was yours awesome yeah um, that's funny uh, yeah but it you know I think I kind of getting back to this idea of what how is it going to impact or how is it going to how is it going to change we're trying to think. We, we've done the digital trade shows and the market appointments over the last week, but also just thinking in the minds of the consumer, um, you know, with our retail stores or how do you blend kind of the beauty of what retail has presented with the, you know, the offering of technical. So whether it's concierge type walkthroughs of product um, in like a one-on-one -on -one shopping environment via video with a product expert um, and really, you know, teach people about the brand and, um, and that aspect. And, uh, you know, in terms of merchandising mix, like we have leaned in more to the active stuff because people are running more. Yeah. And, uh, you know, at least our, our, our um, experience from a sales perspective is we were starting to shift a lot more into these lifestyle pieces, these dress shirts, um, these work pants, and we're seeing a dramatic shift back into our active and lounge stuff, which is great because our wholesale base was there. And as wholesalers cut, buys in some of those immediate days that allowed us to shift that inventory into our direct channel. And See, I told you, you Don, know, more people are running. I'm mm -hmm. telling you. This. They are. <laughs> they are. Yeah, I, I don't know. I mean, there's obviously ways of calculating that. And I, you know, I spoke to the CEO of Charity Miles and he's seeing it from a data standpoint. Mm -hmm. So I'm sure there, like, there is a way of, of proving it. By the way, Don, my first <laughs> running shoes ever were Saucony. Hey. Um, and uh, so, so I'm a big fan. But. All right. I got you. I got you. Covered. <laughs> <laughs> um, I would love to hear, I think a lot of people, you guys have seen what Facebook um, and Twitter have, and Twitter just said you can work remotely indefinitely, which was uh, big news. I think Facebook said um, okay. it's totally up to you to the end of the year. I'm curious, you know, what your guys' thoughts are individually and even at the executive level, um, you know, some of the, some of the conversations you're having, um, how do you think your brand's going to approach it and maybe, I guess, capitalize on the fact that the systems are now in place. I think you've all told me that you've been impressed with productivity overall. So if it hasn't opened up our eyes on this call, it's opened up somebody's eyes, I'm sure, at uh, your different brands. But how do you think this changes the way that we work in America? I'll, Don, I'll start with you. I think the, it's been profound what we've been able to, the productivity we've seen and the, um, when you just think about human resources in Boston, you can't go anywhere, commute anywhere. And it, it takes an hour each way. That's a two hour round trip death march for people every day. And it's soul crushing at the same time. So we're, even though the governor announced today, you can slowly start to come back on June 2nd. We're in no rush. I think to Nate's point, everybody's affected differently and feels differently every day. And the way I'm going to lead our team is to say, if you need to stay home, stay home. We trust you. And yeah. um, if you need to come in because you just want to see your colleagues, well, welcome. It'd be great to see you. And so we're just going to be really human about it. But I do think um, there is a seismic shift in the way corporate America is going to do business. And it's, it's pretty cool to see what happens. I've kind of used the example, like if you're, if you have that sexy building in the middle of Manhattan and you're paying whatever, $200,000 a month for that building, I'm sure a lot of people are thinking, do we actually need this? I mean, can we save this money 
is corporate real estate really going to be hit overall? Because a lot of these companies are going to say, hey, this I didn't think this was going to work, but holy holy crap, it did work. <laughs> Let's keep this going. Um, Steve, you know, from from what you personally believe and maybe at the executive level too, um, how do you think you guys are going to approach kind of the remote working now into the future? And Yeah, I think the North Face as well has been, you know, uh, very flexible. Um, and, and our executive team right now is scattered around the country. Uh, and, uh, it's, we, you know, the last two and a half months has really proven that it is, uh, it's been, it's been, you know, quite, you know, still very effective. The other thing I would say is we're taking a very, uh, uh, prudent approach to, uh, reinsertion into our offices. It's going to be a rollout over the next three to four months. So like, uh, you know, I would say remote working, you know, is, is going to continue to be a, a big part of, of, uh, you know, of our DNA. And so I, we literally, uh, I, I'll, I'll tell you, that there's one thing that is interesting with the team and we, and um, I think, uh, you know, like uh, Don mentioned it earlier, we were, I was surprised early on when we started Zoom calls that the team would say, we need more Zoom calls. So I would have, a, you know, a, a Zoom call with my staff, direct staff, and then we would have a call with the entire team. So we would get, you know, to, uh, you know, like up to 500 you know, with company calls every week just to get update from the leadership on what's happening. And uh, one of the things that uh, uh, will, it is interesting is I think it's going to be finding the right balance with, you know, community interactions. Because again, when you're in the creative process, you're touching and creating products. 100%. The ability to work with a team, you know, is going to be really important. But, you know, I think, you know, people are going to now find a natural balance between when you're in the office and when you have to be in the office versus when you have to, you know, make a call and, you know, because you have to stay home for whatever reason, at least at the North Face, we never really did, but we're not going to ask questions about where you are when we're having meeting, uh, because you, I think it's going to be part of the new norm as we move forward. Uh, Hilary, what about for you guys? How do you think it changes? Yeah, so look for us, for example, we're going to have a town hall uh, this week. You know, I felt it was important to, to make sure everybody could connect. Um, we're asking those People who are comfortable to come to the office. Um, we've cut down the presenters, obviously. We'll do all the social distancing, blah, blah, blah. But um, so, uh, you know, again, it's, it's going to be that fine balance of work from home, work from wherever you're comfortable, um, get your job done. To me, it doesn't really matter when you do it. It's quality. If you get it done on time. But we will continue to try to find a way to, to interact. I think the human side is important. I think you stimulate each other. I think your creativity can go up uh, as you work, uh, you know, with people uh, in, in video and Zoom, yes. But I also think, you know, we're, we're also a product company, so touching some samples, uh, playing around the product, you know, having a having a knife in your hand and doing something with it. Uh, yeah, there is a difference. So uh, it's going to be up to the employees, same. We're not going to force anybody to be here a certain amount of days or or hours. Uh, you want to come in one morning, you want to come in uh, a couple of days. I don't really care. We're lucky we have lots of space. So, uh, you know, that challenge is, is, is not really a, an obstacle here. But will be lots of freedom. And uh, as, as it was mentioned, again, before, I don't care where people sit, get the job done. <laughs> uh, we're in this together. And, uh, and, and because of it, yeah, I think if you empower the employees, that's what it comes down to. And I think this whole you know, virus has allowed us to really empower people and most yeah. people have Trust. done with it and yeah. have taken that. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, to your point, I, I think at the very least at large companies like all of yours, different departments may be able to make decisions that they don't, they don't have to necessarily touch product or they can operate more remotely. Um, that, that, that'll definitely be a possibility. Nate, I'm also thinking about too, and, and one of you may mention this on the phone that got me thinking was, imagine if you don't have kids running around in the background. Imagine if you don't, yeah. you know, you're not scared about potentially. That yeah, I, that's what you said. Yeah, so sorry to take your quote, kids. but uh, I'll <laughs> let you say so I don't steal your thunder, but I think you made a great point here. No, it's just because I'm surprised we haven't been interrupted yet. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I've, got, I've, got, I've got three little boys running around and I think one of the best, I love the word that Don used, it, you know, it's been so humanizing mm -hmm. this whole process, which is ironic because it's happening, it's happening digitally. But, um, you know, I, I was on a live interview with Entrepreneur Magazine. This is like great interview, wanted to have this set up. And my son came in probably three, 
four times. <laughs> and uh, and the, ed- the first time the editor was like, oh, ha ha. The fourth time the editor was like, this is life and this is great. Yeah. And he, you know, zero judgment. Um, yep. And, but I, I did make the comment, like, if people are finding a way to be productive now, <laughs> imagine, you know, the productivity that can come <laughs> from home when, when they don't have that. But, you know, I think similarly, we're thinking and about also, this phase. Just, uh, just being but, the fear of contracting this disease that you don't know too much about. I mean, that's also, I think all of our emotional capacity has been at a nine or totally. 10. You take that away, you take the kids away, and then you're working from home. You may be 2x productivity. Yeah, I think that's, you know, worrying about um, loved ones who are immunocompromised or mm-hmm. uh, or in an older demographic. There, there has been a lot of uh, emotional um, kind of, uh, there's been an emotional toll or, uh, you know, that's been emotional inventory that's been taken up by this. So I think if you're able to free that up, there's, you know, there's an opportunity. But um what I've been having fun thinking about is what is, what is the new normal look like? You know, what, forget phase one um, and phase two, because I think we can all get creative and think about that. But what is, what is the next end state look like? And I don't know. Um, I think, you know, it's fun to just think that through, but one of the things that we've thought about is how do you capture the magic of being together and also the, the, magic of not being of not having to be together and i do think there are some creative ways to get there and and so that's what we've been spending some of our time thinking about um as we as we get back to it um we are almost out of time so unfortunately we have to kind of wrap it up on this question but um i want to get from your guys's thoughts you know 10 years from now as we look back how do we all grow um from this situation i'll give you a quick example you know, ST and my company, we did a lot of on-site activations like Coachella, South by Southwest, Comic-Con, a lot of, you know, on the ground, build the set, do that whole thing. And almost immediately we pivoted to virtual live streams and we've helped all our partners kind of convert to that. And that's now going to be a brand new revenue stream, even when things get back to normal and we can be on site. Now, I think to your point, Don, people are going to still need those virtual live streams and virtual events. So that's something I'm very thankful for. I'll probably look back on um, Hillary, I'll start with you. You know, what do you think 10 years from now when people ask you about this pandemic and how you sh- uh, shifted and how you pivoted, what's the thing you think you'll, you'll uh, be thankful for? Like, wow, if that didn't happen, it may have not allowed us to do X. Look, I, two, two, two angles. I think from a personal side, um, you know, all the anxiety, I mean, same with kids and family at home and, you know, Old, old, older parents, so I think you're gonna, we're going to look back and see there was uncertainty, stress, mm-hmm. and I like to think it brought us together, right? We're spending more time with our families. We're spending more time together. Uh, so that'll be the positive in many ways. It's actually brought us all closer together to really value, you know, what's important to us. We're, we're going to be safe. We're going to take care of each other. Yeah. Uh, from, a, from a business standpoint, amazing. I mean, within overnight, you can change the direction, Mm -hmm. right? I mean, literally you can decide from one day to another, okay, we're going to have to go down this channel of trade for a while. You know what? Nobody's buying luggage in our case. Let's, let's go sell more cutlery. So I never thought about that. You don't, you may not need the 17 meetings anymore to make a, make a pivot because you've learned like, Hey, we we did it with that. Why can't we move quicker? You know? Yeah. And, and, you know, especially we're, we're a very traditional, you know, Swiss company, which means we don't make a lot of mistakes, but we're very slow. (laughs) And this has really forced their hand to be very quick. Yeah. So, uh, you know, if I'm still mm-hmm. with this company in 10 years, that'll be a big, big turning point for us. Uh, Don, what about for you? What do you think uh, will be the main things that you guys learned from and pivoted and kind of thankful that you did? I think it's really obvious that the more transparent you are, the more engaged your people are, and the more they'll mm-hmm. do anything to feel like they're contributing to the greater good. And so being really upfront and transparent about whether it's the business or a business decision. And then the other one is from a leadership standpoint, empathy. I think everybody on Zoom is clearly a good human being and probably naturally does this, but you can't be empathetic enough with people. There's, I was in a 5K race a couple years ago. And there were people post inspirational signs around town. It's to raise money for something. One of the signs said, hey, be nice to everyone. Everyone's or to be nice. Everyone's dealing with something you don't know. No one else knows about. 100%. I remember that struck me at the time. And I just think 
that doesn't mean I don't mean to get sappy at all. It's just really more about for some people, it's a wonderful day. For other people, it's a tough day. Being mm-hmm. okay with that rhythm and those dynamics as a leader, I think is really important to have the pulse of the team. That's great. I'm not sure if you guys have read the book, Great Game of Business, but to your point, it is amazing. Once the employees know the scoreboard, they'll start to play the game a lot more fiercely. I think that's what happened with every company. People knew what was at stake and they were able to kind of fight towards that and and uh, be able to come together as a team. Um, Steve, what about for you? I mean, very similar to what was meant. I think the two points for me is first values. You know, brands, you know, you know, we show their values and live their values. You know, not only will continue to, uh, you know, uh, get the most out of their, their employees, but also uh, I think are going to be brands that consumer will keep choosing as we move forward. And it's been really, uh, really inspiring to see that within the North space with the second point, which was agility. You know, we've completely changed our plan. We've completely changed our giving strategy and said, hey, we're going to dedicate a million dollars to support first responders and the outdoor community. And we're going to work in creating a bigger ripple effect to support, you know, the outdoor community who's, uh, who's being hit extremely hard, you know, through, through that process. And we're going to be there through the recovery. And, you know, it, it, normally to, uh, to uh, implement such changes, we take quite a while because we're a big organization with a lot of stakeholders and we literally did that in half a day, yeah. which, you know, like it was really inspiring. And, uh, and, and because, you know, the, you know, our teammates, you know, every, you know, the employees, everyone would just rally against it and obstacles became, you know, like, uh, irrelevant because, you know, everyone had, had a common goal. And, it, and the second point is agility. Uh, I think to, uh, Hillary's point, uh, I think it showed, at least it showed our team, uh, the incredible resiliency that we have in pivoting fast, mm. you know, so that we can, you know, serve consumer better and, and, uh, and, and be uh, a lot more mindful about how we can add value, you know, in their lives during the journey that they're at, which for a while we were all in the same journey. We we're all stuck at home. We're all trying to figure out what was next. As things starts to open up, these journeys will become more diverse. And, you know, and I think the ability to stay very agile with the, the, you know, the communities that we serve. And for us, we serve very different communities, whether you're a skier, a snowboarder, a trail runner, uh, you know, a hiker, a light hiker. And whether you do that in Europe versus the U.S. or versus China, the environment can be very different. And I think it's going to be really uh, important for us to uh, apply what we've learned the last two and a half months uh, as we move forward. Yeah, it feels like every brand uh, turned into a startup brand overnight um, and was able to pivot quickly. To your point, in the past, if you were going to add a new color to one of your jackets, maybe that takes seven layers of approval. <laughs> but now that you know you can do that in record speed, it just may change efficiency overall. Uh, Nate, I'll, I'll let you uh, kind of end it off with what you think you'll look back on. Well, I mean, I just have to end with what I started on. It like I think being just being surrounded by these amazing brands is really special to me. I, I already said that my first running shoes were Saucony shoes. I remember driving cross country with my dad. And you bought a Stockton. Swiss Army knife. You've had to buy a Swiss Army knife. Well, no, it's better than that. <laughs> we were driving, my dad and I were driving cross country and we stopped by the North Face store in the heart of Chicago. And, uh, and, and that was my high school graduation present was a, a North Face duffel yeah. that I still wow. have. And when I got my um, first job coming out of college, I got a signing bonus and I bought a Victorinox briefcase with it. So like, <laughs> this is kind of a really special there you go. Surrounded yeah, by, full circle by, by brands that just think long term. And to me, like, that's what this is about. I think you saw a lot of short term thinking in this pandemic. And I think, you know, whether, whether you're a digitally native brand or you've been around for a hundred years, the brands that will be well thought of coming out of this are the ones that thought long-term and not short-term. How do we think about taking care of our teams? How do we think about taking care of our customers? How do we think about taking care of our suppliers? Not just how do we take care of ourselves? And Mm -hmm. I've always tried to say, let's be long-term relationship people. And -hmm. let's think of every relationship that we make as a long-term relationship. And, um, and, and so I think that has just been reinforced to me over and over again throughout this process that, you know, if you think of yourself as a long-term relationship brand with your teams, not just, you know, not just while they're employed, but if they go on to other places, 
with your customers, whether they're shopping with you right now or they're not in a you know, they're not in a place to shop, and with your suppliers. And um, and I think that's what builds great companies, um, and it's what we're trying to stay committed to doing, no matter how hard it becomes. That's awesome. Uh, great note to end on that. Uh, again, if it wasn't for this situation, it, it may have been hard to get all you leaders here at the same time uh, for mm. this talk as well. That probably would have been a rare occurrence, but now we're all connected and I'll make sure that this whole group is connected to each other as well for any networking or any future conversations. Mm -hmm. But gentlemen, it's been awesome, man. I think uh, the you, I think I've learned a lot from all of you so far. And then also the audience will really appreciate the knowledge you dropped and hope you guys found value out of it as well. Very much so. Thanks a lot. All right. Great. Thanks so much, team. Thank you very we'll talk much. To you soon. You. See you guys. Adios. Bye, Bye, everybody. Take care. There it is, Will. Again, thanks so much for booking those amazing guests. Like I said towards the end, I'm excited because, you know, you saw Nate, his his eyes light up really because he, you know, he's a CEO and he's a founder and he was a, he was a kid once and he owns all this product. And now he's on a panel with all these different leaders at this product. So he was super stoked. And I'm just glad that I can connect people. That's one of my, you know, visions and dreams as well. It's like now Nate knows Don and now Don knows Hillary and now they can connect. And uh, like I mentioned too, I don't know, man, I think all these guys and, and gals that we're talking to on these panels are so busy on planes and meetings that this, this COVID-19 time has actually allowed people to have a little bit more time in their day. And that's the reason I think, honestly, we were able to probably get all those leaders together on one time at one call. That was pretty awesome. And I think going back to, to Nate for a second, it's, the other three are such large brands that have been so yeah. well established for a long time. It was cool to have kind of the other side of the coin on, Hey, yeah. we're a, a newer brand in the space and here's how we operate and here's how we did things versus um, three kind and, of titans of the industry. And I didn't want to steal a thunder there. I forgot who told me, but Nate was the one that told me like, Hey man, our employees overall, and I've heard this from everywhere in the industry, employees are being super productive. But again, imagine when the kids finally go back to school and they're not yelling in the background. And then also imagine everybody's emotional and, and mental capacity are about at a nine or 10 because they're watching the news and they're worried about their loved ones, worried about their parents, grandparents, et cetera. Um, so imagine how that productivity can even jump to a whole new level rather than people wondering, oh, are we only being productive because we're fearful for our jobs, so therefore we're working harder. I think it's the exact opposite. I think we'll see productivity from a remote standpoint continue to skyrocket. So it's very interesting. Learn so much from all those individuals and so excited to continue the conversation with them and learn from them as we move forward. All right, Will, thank you so much. Dave Furker, we were here in studio, back at it with our face mask and our sanitizer, uh, staying six feet apart. We appreciate you. We appreciate Dave Furker. Thank you so much for everybody on the panel. This has been yet another edition of the Business Social Podcast. We hope that you rate us on iTunes five stars. Check us out on YouTube. Check us out on Spotify. It's been powered by, of course, STN Digital, and I'm your host, David Brickley.